Hello. OK, audio is working. It seems that way. So uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm going to be talking a lot about InnoDB internals. So I'm skipping some of the prerequisites. I'm not telling you that MySQL has this storage engine concept. It's almost like a proxy into different ways of storing data. And a lot of people are using MyISM, and they shouldn't be. They should be using InnoDB. And a lot of its history, why we haven't been using InnoDB, we should have been. And finally, MySQL and InnoDB under the same roof at Oracle. It's now the default in 5.5. So why should you be using it? Well, I think the reason why uh, a lot of people think you should be using it are for the wrong reasons. That's the funniest thing from my perspective. So here's my list of why you should be using it. I wanted to share that with you. I think one of the best things about InnoDB uh, is that it's transactional. It's ACID compliant. When it says it does something, it guarantees that. And we'll talk a little bit about the algorithms in a second and, and really what that means. I think you should be using InnoDB because it scales well on modern hardware. If you're using something like MyISM, it has a lot of internal locking that creates issues when you have 16 and 32 core machines. And I think you should be using InnoDB for a, a reason that might be hard to measure. Uh, a lot of what benchmarks these days are, are doing, corrupted a little bit by some other database movements, uh, is they're measuring peak throughput. They're not measuring what is one of InnoDB's goals, which is consistent results. Every query gets approximately the same time, more or less. And there's a lot of focus into making this work really nicely. So that's my preface. This is why I like InnoDB, and this is why I think you should like InnoDB. Uh, what's interesting is why should you yes or no use InnoDB in what I think is common myths. And uh, I, I wouldn't say that only use InnoDB if you knew, use foreign keys is one at all. I, I actually use InnoDB, but I often don't use foreign keys. Uh, I think InnoDB is probably faster at reads a lot faster it reads except for maybe table scans and index scans, and I rarely do them on my production database systems. So this one is a myth as well. To say that InnoDB doesn't scale, uh, InnoDB got a lot of criticism because InnoDB was owned by Oracle, and MySQL was previously not owned by Oracle. Uh, part of this was truth, part of it was not, and a lot of it is, is less true than it ever was. And the reason that I have at the end which is why some people can't migrate to InnoDB is because they're using my eyes in full text search. You don't want to use my eyes in full text search. Uh, you want to use some other full text implementation because my eyes in is relevancy ranking. And it's performance when these indexes can't fit in, in memory. It's just woeful. Friends don't let friends use my eyes in. So how I'm going to talk about this, I, I'm going to talk about InnoDB and I'm going to talk about a lot of the internals. I'm going to try and do it in, in these points. And I, I confess that I often do this in a day, and I can spend the whole day talking about this. And, and I made some trade-offs, and I, I'm doing it in about 65 slides, and I'm going to have to speak really fast to be able to do that. So uh, I won't have much time for questions. So what I want to do instead is I want you to raise your hands if you have questions. And uh, I'll try and stop and answer them. And if I can't, then I'll try and take them offline. But that's my strategy that I'm going to go forward with. So first, I want to talk about the basic uh, operations of InnoDB. And to explain that, we have to explain a lot about hardware. Database systems really sit very close to the hardware, and a lot of things are important to understand, to understand how InnoDB works. So the first thing to explain about hardware is that disks are really, really slow. So here I'm grabbing some numbers from a presentation by an engineer at Google, and it's showing the relative speeds of every component you know, in your architecture. And at the top here, we've got sort of a CPU. Uh, we can do a, a CPU cycle in less than a billionth of a second. And then we've got main memory, 100 nanoseconds, and nanosecond is a billionth of a second. And we can do things like a round trip within the same data center in uh, 500,000 nanoseconds, uh, about half of a, a millisecond. But what we can't do uh, with any relative speed comparing to that is even read from our own local disks. It's faster to read from another node on the network in main memory than it is to read from our own disk. Disks are really slow. A disk takes about 10 uh, milliseconds to be able to do an operation. And this is like one one hundredth of a second. Big difference from one billionth of a second that we're looking at for CPUs. Uh, what's even more interesting about this number, if I extrapolate from what I saw in this presentation, and with my own understanding of, of hardware, I can say that they were talking about probably a 7200 RPM hard drive that can do 100 operations per second. Uh, if we go into enterprise drives and we talk 15K RPM drives, it's probably not that much more. At best, it might be double. And what's also interesting is there's a lot of variance in this number. They're just picking an average number. 
depending on what sort of I.O. operation you're doing, it might not be this number. There could be, you know, somewhere in between these really wide numbers. And that very high number you might not see uh, all the time. I'm picking like a slow laptop drive or something like that, but uh, I'm trying to illustrate a point. Disks are really slow. So if we look at how uh, operations work inside, let's start with the operating system. Uh, the operating system, when you try and read data, it has caches. When you try and write data, it tries to buffer that data. So here I'm trying to write block 9, block 10, block 1, 4, 200. Think of a buffer as almost like a funnel. The more time that we spend in this buffer, the more opportunity that we have to do request reordering and merging. And as we can do that request reordering and merging, we get better performance to the disk because we do more sequential I.O. If you want to know how much better off sequential I.O. is, I can flip back to this chart back here. It takes 10 milliseconds to be able to read the first byte. It takes 20 milliseconds to be able to read a full megabyte. This is the performance model of disks. Huge difference between sequential I.O. Uh, versus random. So the operating system has a way to get better performance. For reads, it has caching. For writes, it has buffering. One of the interesting things about just writing to an operating system like this is that this buffer is lost if we lose power. So if you want to know why my ISM is so fast, because it just acts like any other dumb program and just writes to this OS write buffer. You want to know why InnoDB is slow, because InnoDB asks the operation, operating system constantly, can you empty this buffer? Can you do what's called syncing? flushing. This is why by default InnoDB is much slower than my eyes are. What's also interesting here is that if we use hardware, like a hardware RAID controller, it'll have a buffer of its own sitting on that RAID controller and you'll get all your performance back. It'll do its request reordering and merging and you'll get comparable performance again if you use good hardware with InnoDB. And you also have some settings to be able to tune this, but I'll get to this in a second. I have to explain this as a prerequisite to be able to uh, explain how InnoDB's algorithms work. InnoDB has to be durable. It has to guarantee as part of this promise it makes for asset compliance that data will be safe on disk. And something like MyISM doesn't make that same promise. So let's look at the basic operation of InnoDB. Uh, here we have, uh, by default, IBData1 on disk. We call it our, our table space. Uh, we have our buffer pool, which is an in-memory configuration for, for caching what is on the table space. We have a series of log files. By default, two of them. They're going to be called iblog0 and iblog1. They're going to be stored in that same common data di uh, directory with all of your MySQL data. So we're going to do an operation on this system. We're going to do to start with a select query. Select star from city where country code equals AUS. We've got a table with all of the cities in the world. And we're going to look inside the buffer pool. We're going to say, is the data that we're looking for there? In this case, my server has just started up, so it's going to load that data from the table space into the buffer pool, and then it's going to return results. This is fairly dumb. This is how most caches work. What we do is we have some in-memory version of this same data. These are 16K pages. They look pretty much the same. There's no transformation for how they look in memory. How does an update work, though? This is a little bit more interesting. We're going to do an update on this same data. We're going to update our table here, update some of the rows we just selected. For an update, what we do is we make a modification in memory to the buffer pool, resulting in, in terminology we call a dirty page. And then we record history of that modification being made to these log files. And then actually for you as an application developer, you get an act back to say that that operation has been successful. This is an in-memory copy of this somewhere here, but it's had a modification made. We don't have to make that modification from here to here yet. We delay that operation. We delay that operation, and it might be one second or it might be one hour. Inevitably, we have to do this but it doesn't concern you when this dirty page gets written back down to the table space. When it gets written back down, then this page gets marked as clean, and then if we have to make space in the buffer pool, then we can. But by default, you don't have to care when that happens. You do care, actually, as, as a performance tuning uh, problem, but uh, just to start with, at the basic algorithm, this is purely an optimization. What InnoDB do, is doing is it's doing log file I.O., which are just very 
small rights to be able to remember how to recover if we had some sort of failure. And flushing the log, making sure that it's synced down on disk is a huge thing for performance. The log file I.O. is cheap, but it has to happen in the foreground. So our, our users will be waiting. That'll be blocking while that's being written. The I.O. that we have to do to do those updates, write those dirty pages down to the table space. Now that we've introduced time, we can do some sort of reordering and merging with them as well. So we can get optimization for sequential I.O. and then we can get optimization for sequential I.O. And this is the basic algorithm of InnoDB. And I, I ask as sort of like an open question, it shouldn't matter that we've saved enough to recover. Actually, it does matter. Um, if we have too many pending changes, we have really slow crash recovery. That's the main risk that we have. So we know to be in this algorithm, it writes to the log files for recovery purposes. It actually never even reads back from the log files unless we had a crash. They're just written to. We have some in-memory uh, lists to be able to describe uh, what pending dirty pages we have. And if we have clean pages, you know, which ones can we free if we need to make space? That's another list, and we call that LIU. I won't go into the specifics of this, but it is mem in memory lists to be able to avoid having to ever read from that log file. We just write to it. And all log activities are assigned a log sequence number. You might see that show up in show in ODB status. Most databases work this way. Uh, we're not unique in, in ODB. Uh, the terminology can differ just a little bit. In Oracle, they prefer to call these logs, redo logs. We call them transaction logs most of the time in InnoDB. In Oracle, they write full pages to the redo log. In InnoDB's transaction logs, we just write very short updates to be able to remember the minimum. And the background operation that I was talking about of writing down those dirty pages, that's called a checkpoint. This is the main algorithm of InnoDB. So we understand this, we can start making optimizations. Open question, what's the first optimization we could make on the log files? What could we do to them? Uh, we could increase them. Sure, the, the, the log files are a way of creating some sort of buffering of background operations. And we can use larger log files, smooth out our load by having a larger log. More work we can get delayed behind on. There's actually another setting related to the, the log files here, which is to say how many log files. Uh, and it's really, in ODB's effective log size is log file size multiplied by how many log files there are. There's no difference from InnoDB's perspective if you have three 7 meg logs or two 10 meg logs. It treats it the same like one logical log. And the default is two. Uh, we also have some options to be able to change the durability of this log file. So now whenever someone says commit, we just write to that operating system write buffer and we don't ask it to sync constantly. If we're using really cheap hardware that doesn't have that battery back write cache on our RAID controller, this might get you some performance back. Just, for example, the default is, is one. If we set this to two, it'll just every one second do a background operation to be able to sync that log file. Otherwise, it's just going to be buffering it in a buffer before it writes it to the log file. Um, this buffer is normally uh, perfectly sized. It's just if you're doing large text and blobs that you might change this buffer. This one you'd only ever change if you were accepting that you were going to use cheap hardware and you weren't going to use a RAID controller. And uh, a little bit of detail I, I sort of described already is that uh, as part of recovery, we're replaying through that log file, figuring out what changes needed to be reapplied because we haven't applied them to the table space yet. And actually, because we're doing some of our background work out of order, crash recovery takes a really long time. We can find out that some changes have already been made. And if they've already been made, uh, we know it because the pages internally all store their log sequence number, the, the mark of last known modification. And you can see some of these details in something like show in ODB status. Here we can see the highest log sequence number ever handed out to any transaction that's running. The highest log sequence number that's ever made it into our log files and the highest log sequence number for which all background work is completely done. If you have a difference between those bottom two numbers, expect a very long crash recovery. I have a rough sizing guide of, of something that's more or less rule of thumb, saying have enough log space for an hour's worth of work. You might set that larger if you can tolerate 
worse crash recovery or smaller if you want to have a small amount of crash recovery. I like that InnoDB gives this as a choice to me. If we look at some other database systems where we have something like my eyes and corruption which can happen during failure, it's the size of the table which dictates what the recovery is because we have to look through everything again. InnoDB is, is, is nice in this design for production. So I have some frequently asked questions at this point. Um, what do we write to the log file? Is it committed data or is it uncommitted data? It's actually both types of data get written to the log file. We write to the log file straight away as you're making modifications, whether or not those modifications were permitted yet or not. It's very optimistic in this design. And by using this design, we can ensure that we can do bigger transactions than what we have memory for, because we're making the modifications straight away. Uh, it actually does mean that as well as being able to reapply transactions through our log file system, we also have to be able to unapply the transactions. Something I haven't explained yet is that InnoDB also has something called undo information. Log files reapply changes, undo information unapplies changes. And the undo information is, in InnoDB's case, not stored in the log file. It's always going to be stored in IBData1, that central table space. Some transactions also in the database system, they have to be able to see old versions of the data. We'll get to why that is in a second. But they also look at undo information to be able to see that. So this is the, the basic algorithm of InnoDB. How's everyone going? All right, awesome. So let's look at the on-disk format. Let's look at how InnoDB stores data. The simplified version of InnoDB storage is that everything is stored in this format called a table space, inside pages in this table space. And the default mode of this table space is one file called ibdata1. And in this same mode, you can have multiple files, ibdata1, ibdata2, ibdata3. It'll fill the first one, then it'll fill the next one. But it doesn't do any round robining or striping. It just works in this mode. There's another mechanism called InnoDB file per table where every table is its own table space. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But the sort of data that we have to store in InnoDB is at least this data. It's not just the data in terms of data and indexes. There's a lot of other data that happens internally. So I want to I wanna draw it as a picture because it's going to be a little bit easier to explain. Let's pretend what IBData1 might look like if I apply a little bit of a simplification. IBData1 divided into 16K pages. We probably have some initial metadata in IBData1. Then we have some sort of data dictionary. InnoDB was actually a standalone database once upon a time. Uh, before it was plugged into InnoDB, much like MySQL remembers how to create tables, InnoDB has to have its own copy and reference of that, separate from the .frm files that you might be familiar with. Uh, InnoDB also has this undo information. It's always stored in IBData1. And then we might have table one, then we might have table two, and then we might have table one again. Uh, tables are not guaranteed to be stored contiguous. They're allocated in a, in a format called extents, and, or, and it might not be you know, 16K at a time. It's probably going to be a mega at a time. Why I want to show you this more specifically is that this is IBData1, and this is if we use InnoDB file per table. So, if we use InnoDB file per table, and sorry, I can see it's a little bit unclear, but if we have table1.ibd and table2.ibd here, if we copy table2.ibd to another host, do we have a complete backup of table2.ibd? No, we don't. I see someone shaking their head, and you'll discover this very fast if you move to InnoDB from my eyes name. It doesn't have the same portability of just copying files. There's some information about table2.ibd such as its data description that's not going to be stored in this file, and it never will be. And there's undo information describing this table as well. So we have to be careful with that caveat. Um, if we expand on storage just a little bit and we talk about how allocations work, I, I'm going to get not too deep here, uh, but I'm going to lay out the, the terminology so it'll help you reviewing things like show on ODB status. Segments fit into table spaces. Segments have extents, uh, and extents are made up of pages. And you can think of this as some sort of allocation system to 
Some of how you live on a house that's on a street and, and so on. This is the internal terminology. Um, if we look at a page, I think it's fun to look at a page. This is what a data page might look like in InnoDB. Here we have a series of rows of variable length sitting inside a data page. And a data page has a, a header and a, and a footer. And there's a rule that says that a row must fit within a page. Or rather, two rows must fit within a page. And it has a special handling of text, blob, and long varchars. Um, what I like to show here is things like the header and the trailer and say how InnoDB is just a fantastic database in that it's defensive for all of the, the shortcomings of hardware or failure. It's prepared for failure. And one thing that I like that it has is it has a page checksum so that it will notice if there's some sort of on-disk corruption. It'll checksum the page and then it'll save that into the header here. And if we have some sort of hardware failure, InnoDB is going to detect this. And it's actually going to intentionally crash your server. Because in InnoDB's minds, mind with this checksum, it would rather have a complete system down if your hardware has been lying and wait for your intervention rather than keep running. And if you look at something like MyISM or some other databases, you'll find this silent corruption just spring up on you all of a second. InnoDB is designed to be defensive. It's designed to be asset compliant and give some of these promises. The cost of this checksum should be relatively low. It only checks the checksum whenever it's reading from disk. A read from disk takes something like 10 milliseconds. Calculating this checksum is probably in the microsecond range. And it updates the checksum if it's writing back to, to disk. Uh, in newer versions of InnoDB, the company I work for makes a special version of InnoDB that's enhanced. Uh, this might become a bigger problem on SSTs because SSTs are much faster at, at reading and writing data. But this is a good feature. If we look at what a row looks like, there's just one thing or two things that I want to point out because it's going to help us for the next section, which is a row internally has a couple of internal coordinates here to remember at what ID this row was created, what transaction ID, and be able to see earlier versions of the row in undo space. It helps me out with this segue to this next feature called multi-version concurrency control. So who's familiar with multi-version concurrency control? OK, a few people. This is an exciting topic. This is, uh, this is how InnoDB is not slower at, at reads or not slower than, uh, than my eyes am. It's really quite good when you've got a lot of people in a system at once. It gives very good concurrency. Let's talk about how it works. So, here we've got a, a social networking website. We've got three tables. We've got users. Users write blog posts, and users can be friends with each other. In this case, Morgan is friends with Tom. Tom is friends with Morgan. Baron and Morgan are friends, and, and that is a mutual relationship there as well. So on this social networking schema, I'm going to do an operation. Doesn't matter what operation I'm going to do, but I'm going to do a backup because it's the easiest way to explain why this feature is required. So I'm going to back up these three tables. I'm going to start with the users table, and I'm going to read through it. And I'm going to start reading through the blog post table, and I'm going to back that up. And while I'm backing this blog post table up, and it's taking me quite a while, uh, let me just zoom back on that for a second. Uh, this is a, a multi-user system, so someone else is doing something. And that someone else just inserted a new record that wasn't here before. They inserted this user, Justin, who likes pizza. And this new user, as soon as they were inserted there, they decided that they were going to be friends with Baron. My operation at this point is still backing up through the blog post table. It just finishes, and now it starts backing up the user friendship table. And we have a race condition here. Here's the data that I would have if I tried to restore from backup. Can you see the dilemma? I had already backed up the users table, and then I started backing up the user friendship table. And now I have this data, and I didn't want to see that data. One of the rules of databases, one of the rules of consistent reads, is that we have to represent a single point in time for any database operation. That single point in time can be the start of when the operation runs, or it can actually be the end of the operation. It doesn't matter. We have to represent a single point in time to be able to stop these race conditions from happening. This is a, an acid requirement. 
for consistent reads. And we can drop some of the consistency requirements a little bit. But anyway, that's, that's explained, for example, how, how my eyes am solves this problem. So we don't have any race condition. So we want to back up these three tables. Here's what my eyes am does. Read lock. Now nobody can write to those tables. Other people are allowed to read to them, but nobody can write to those tables. But now let's back them up and we get a consistent view of the data. This really hurts performance. Readers block writers. How does InnoDB do this? Well, InnoDB has this hidden metadata, the transaction ID, and missing from my slide, there's also another column called rollback pointer, where basically as you're reading through this data, you just remember a series of coordinates. I'm transaction number 100. I can't see past 100. If there's a version called 101, don't let me see it. If there's a version older than this number, don't let me see it. I'm just going to be able to see these changes. And by remembering this set of coordinates, there'll be multiple versions of a row. You'll only see the ones that you were supposed to be able to see. And you don't have readers blocking writers. You get very good concurrency. And I just have a little snapshot of showing those coordinates working in ShownoDB status. And it reads those old versions of rows from undo space. OK. So now we're up to some of the more advanced features. Uh, we're up to talking about how InnoDB stores data and in indexes. And rather, actually all data in InnoDB is stored in an index. There's no thing as data, there's just indexes. So uh, when you create a table and you say you have a primary key, it's physically sorted in that primary key. Everything is an index. I'll show a, an example of my ISM to start with because it makes it easier to be able to explain this. We have an MYI file storing indexes. We have an MYD file storing data. The data is stored in roughly the order that the rows were inserted. There's no guarantees if something is deleted, we're going to insert back into a gap here. Basically, it's just like a long array of data. And then we have this index file, which is sorted here in, in some sort of tree structure, a B tree. And if we did something like a, a prime wiki lookup on this staff table, and we said, let's go and let's try and look for a particular user. We're going to look for user number five. If we're looking up a primary key index or any other index, we find that pointer for five, and then we just look up that row. Let's look at how it works in InnoDB with its clustered index. InnoDB, the primary key looks like this. It's the same structure as the MyISM indexes. We're looking for user number two. When we find number two there, we actually just stop. The data is stored in the index, stored in the leaf node of the, of the primary key tree here. So uh, when we get to there, we stop. And actually, primary key lookups in InnoDB are really fast. If you can design your, your structure around this, this is a very nice feature. Nice, uniformly consistent read time, rather than having to read somewhere, then follow a pointer. And if we look at a secondary key index, how does this work? Well, a secondary key index would be a traversal of a, of a normal index structure. And actually, in the back of the secondary key index, we remember the value of the primary key. And remember that the person with the extension number seven uh, was the same person who was user ID number seven. And then we traverse this primary key index and we find the full row. So NoDB is actually just a little bit slower at, at secondary key lookups. Because navigating two trees is more expensive than navigating one tree and then some sort of hash-like lookup. But it has a nice feature to be able to make secondary index faster as well. I'll talk about that in a second. So this design has some interesting consequences that you need to be aware of. Uh, you need to know that primary key lookups are very fast, and you should engineer for that. Inserting data in order is very fast. Out of order is very slow, as it causes some page splits. And secondary indexes actually become very large if you have a very large primary key, because it feeds that primary key into the secondary index. In practical terms, this can be explained very similar. Uh, simply, don't use GUIDs for InnoDB tables. It's the silliest thing for performance ever. And uh, some indexing structure, like adding primary keys into secondary key indexes, doesn't make sense either. So next section, insert buffer and adaptive hash. 
How's everyone going so far? Yeah? All right, awesome. So let's talk about those secondary key lookups and how they're really slow. Secondary key lookups are slow because we, uh, we go through a secondary index, we find the value of the primary key, and then we find that data row. Our most workloads, most access patterns have hotspots. You know, when there's a new Harry Potter movie announced, everyone on forums talking about that. It's like the most exciting thing ever. So InnoDB monitors actually your index usage, which parts of your key you're accessing. And assuming that there are some hotspots, which there will be, uh, most access patterns describe what we call like some sort of Ziffian distribution, where the most popular thing is twice as popular as the next popular thing, which was twice as popular as the, the next thing below that. What InnoDB is going to do is it's going to allocate a special area of memory here, a hashed style index. So uh, here, we're going to be searching for some particular user, normally by extension. Uh, but before we look by extension, we just search the hash. And we say, is it in this hash, which is not a complete index. It's just a small index for hotspots. And then in this case, the particular user that we're looking for with extension number five, we're looking for them all the time. And so we have a special pointer to be able to say, for extension number five, that's user uh, ID number seven. And actually, it avoids scanning this tree, and it avoids scanning this tree, and it uses a pointer just to the leaf node of this primary key index. Secondary indexes can be quite fast. We don't have too much transparency into the operation of this, but on my server, you can see here that this alloc automatically allocated in memory and was using 126 megabytes of memory. I like that InnoDB has these features. If you compare this to my ISM, it has none of this. It just relies on normal index lookups. Um, if we look at a, a particular interesting characteristic of indexes as well, indexes when they don't fit in memory can get quite slow. Because as we insert into these indexes, they, we can get random I.O. Uh, on, on disk. So I'll draw some pictures to explain this better. Uh, there's a feature called the insert buffer and it's designed to be able to merge I.O. for index operations. This buffering of, of inserting into indexes is completely safe. There's no mistakes that are ever going to be made in this operation. Pictures describe it better, so I'm going to skip forward here and, and show this picture here. So here we have our classic B-tree structure. It's a, it's a phone book of names. And let's pretend that this isn't this big. It's, it's like massively larger. So, with this index, not all of it could fit in memory, but maybe just the first couple of levels deep of the index, and then the rest can't. Uh, often, with something like a primary key, we could be always inserting into the end of the index, because we just allocate numbers uh, sequentially. But the secondary index is, you know, you don't get to say that everyone that goes in the phone book, their name's going to be alphabetically further along. It can become random I.O. from these pages that have to be read up and modified and things like that. So if we try and insert something like Buckley into the phone book, it ends up being here. If we insert Myers, it ends up being here. If we insert Jones, it ends up being here. It's all over the place. The performance of this particular structure, and this is the structure that basically all databases use, a tree structure, um, it really depends on this structure fitting in memory to get good performance. If we look at what the insert buffer does is rather than inserting those trees directly, where they were destined to insert them into this buffer. And then what we do when these things are inserted in this buffer, background operation, we try and merge those operations. We've got free time. And Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. So we have this buffer. We fill the buffer. And then as a background operation, we try and empty the buffer. But that might not be soon enough. So if we look at what happens if someone tried to read uh, for Jones, and the data for Jones is sitting in the insert buffer, what the read operation does is it quickly, before it loads up that data page, is checks if any operations were pending for it. And just in time, it makes that change. So this insert buffer is a tree-like structure of its own. And it's quite efficient if we had, sorry, to load that page, we just build it just in time. 
And this feature is on by default in InnoDB, and it's a great feature. InnoDB, if you have a lot of data, is going to scale better than my eyes am. And we get some visibility into it here. We can see the total size of it, and we can see if there's any efficiency, like merges, it's going to be here. Any number here is good. It means we've reduced doing an I.O., and I.O. is just so expensive. Um, that's how it looks like in MySQL 5.1 and, and greater. It looked a little bit different in early releases. Have some additional notes there. This feature, uh, Facebook has actually released some sample data, and they get about a 30 time reduction, 30 times reduction on I/O from the secondary indexes by having this feature enabled. In MySQL 5.5, they changed the name slightly. They call this change buffering in all documentation. And it now also buffers deletes and updates, not just inserts. So we delay part of the operation. So now we're on to double write buffer. I can see the, uh, the tension building. It gets, uh, it gets harder and harder, doesn't it? So I actually um, I made a little bit of a simplification earlier when I showed how that background operation works. It doesn't really work how I described it did. Um, what we do is when we have to make a modification from the buffer pool to the table space on disk is we actually do it twice. We do it twice for safety. Because when a file system or the operating system in the layer below, when we ask it to write something like 16K of data, it actually doesn't guarantee that it writes 16K of data. It doesn't guarantee anything. It could fail halfway in between that operation. And write the first half and then not the second half or complete garbage. And InnoDB doesn't like that idea. It wants to be durable. So what InnoDB does is, if we look at this background operation, first it writes in the buffer pool to the double write buffer. It syncs the double write buffer to the table space. When that operation has been synced, it's doing this for about 64 pages at a time. Then it's allowed to call that operation successful and it makes sure that it syncs to each of the individual destined pages. If we had a crash before we've written to the double write buffer, nothing is successful. If we had a crash in between writing to the double write buffer in each of these individual pages, the first stage of crash recovery is restoring from the double write buffer. That costs a little bit to be able to do that. We're writing everything twice. In, in terms of hard drives, it's probably like one meg of sequential I.O. here. And then it's random over to this location, so that cost might only be 10% more. But if you're comparing InnoDB to another database and you're saying that it's slower, understand what problems it's trying to solve. It wants to give you some promises, and this is one of them. So the implementation of this, as it, as it does this, is it's about 2 meg of IB data 1 is stored and reserved for double write buffer. Uh, the first part of writing this buffer, only one thread can do it. And then the background process, we can use multiple threads to be able to do that. And I'll talk a little bit about this in, in my next section, which is some advantages that InnoDB has for faster hardware. So you want to use this buffer. It's on by default. Why would you turn it off? You'd only turn it off if you had something like ZFS. There are very few file systems that, that promise that a write will be successful. ZFS is one of them. ButterFS on Linux is another. There's just some small caveats with this design. And the small caveat is, is that actually it can cause a lot of write I.O. to one central area. And in the, in the custom version of, of InnoDB that the company I work for writes, we actually have the ability to relocate that. But we're on the last bit. Adaptive flushing I.O. scalability. What are the nice things in InnoDB that aren't in other databases? So um, when we're talking about the background operation, how much capacity do we use to be able to do that background operation of writing down those dirty pages? Uh, the answer is, is that we use 200 IOPS, is the magic number in all InnoDB releases 5.1 and above. Previous versions, it was 100 IOPS. You can also now set this as a configuration setting to be able to say how much background work you can do. And I'll say why that's important in a second. Um, you can also say that you want to read and write in multiple threads. And this is important for when my RAID controller has 10 disks in something like RAID 10, 
I can write to five of them once and I can read from 10 of them. And I need to be able to set this, otherwise I might not be able to extract all of the capacity that it can offer. Uh, we have also the ab ability to be able to tune some of these things with IO so that if we use SSDs, we disable read ahead. And we can disable the request reordering merging that happens as part of the checkpoint. What a benchmark won't show you when I said one of the NODB's aims was consistent, reliable performance uh, is a benchmark will typically tell you something like, I got so many queries per hour. But it won't tell you if every query took the same amount of time. Um, here's actually what NODB used to look like a, a couple of years ago uh, to show you how and why this is, this is a problem in how we measure performance. This is transactions per minute on, a, on, a, uh, on an NODB system on this blue line. We were doing 35 transactions per minute. This looks really, uh, 35,000 transactions per minute. Uh, this looks like a really exciting number if you consider that these transactions are actually quite complicated and writing a lot of data. Uh, we were doing this for quite a while and then all of a sudden our performance went to zero transactions per minute. Completely tanked. Nothing was happening on this server at that time at all. Um, these are different measurements but we've got writes on the server graphed on the, on the same slide here and you can see what happens to the writes, they just go through the roof all of a sudden, and they go back to nothing again. One, one of the interesting things with, with I think, the lack of, of good benchmarks is that throughput doesn't necessarily measure performance. And when we do things like in NODB and in other databases, we convert a lot of our work to background work. And if we get behind in our background work, we can get in trouble. This is actually something that's happening in NODB because our log file is getting full. We have no more pending space in our log file to be able to make modifications. So we have to free the log before we can create more space and do more work. InnoDB solves this a lot better now. What it does is it has a nice consistent flat line. The less log file space that you have available, the more work it does. It just cranks up the work straight away. And you can also specify how much background work you can do so that line that was at the bottom would just be higher all the time. I would much rather have on my server a, a lower line but more flat than this high line, even if it means worse performance. If we measure something like uh, transactions per minute or transactions per hour, it's not reciprocal to say what time each transaction took. And it's not a good idea to measure the average time for a transaction either. You want 99% of all transactions to take the same amount of time. Measuring the average time for a transaction is like measuring the average temperature of a patient in the hospital. You'll see that there's a lot of healthy people. You won't see that there's a lot of people that are dying, they're suffering. And InnoDB has nice flat performance. So as we sort of get towards the end, I want to draw this picture again. I want to talk about the basic algorithm. If you learn one thing, you'll learn this one. And I'm going to draw in some optimizations that are possible. I, I was talking about algorithms today. That was the intention of my talk. But I'll give you some performance optimization that you can make out of it. So uh, let's do an update operation again. We'll skip the select. We've just loaded some data in memory. We're going to do an update operation on these pages here. This update operation results in, what was the name of the terminology that I had for this modification? A dirty page. And then we record history of this dirty page to the log file. And the log file I.O. is typically aligned to 512 bytes. It's really just the smallest amount of information to be able to remember this modification. In the background, we have to write down that dirty page to the table space. That background operation is referred to as a checkpoint. When that happens doesn't concern you. But if you get too far behind in that work, you have to boost your I.O. capacity, for example. And we write that page to the table space, and now we have the opportunity to make space free here if we needed to. We also have another statistic to be able to know which of the clean pages and make space if we have to. So this buffer pool is in memory. The sizing recommendation for this buffer pool is about 50 to 80% of system memory. What's the default setting? Eight megabytes. How many people have 12 megabytes of memory? Nobody. What's the performance like if you set it to this setting? Maybe 50 times better. 
really matters. In ODB, it's a more complex design and you have to tune it for it to be able to get good performance. Okay, what was the recommendation that I had for the log files? What changes could we make there? I could make it bigger. Yeah, and there was this setting here. Make it bigger, I can get further behind. If I can get further behind, I can smooth out my load. And I can do more request reordering and, and merging as well. And the merging happens because we're probably going to be updating the same pages approximately more than once. And we only have to write them down to the table space once by having a, a bigger log file and more time. Okay, there was another setting that I could change with the log file. Does anyone remember the, the name of the setting? Something about durability. Yes, I can set this one. In order to be flush log at TRX commit, by default, it's one, which means fully durable. If someone says commit, I've got a guarantee I've got that data. If we're using cheap hardware, we might want to set this to something like zero or two. Two is just a little bit safer. It just means you'll lose only a second of data. Okay. Um, this one I, I haven't described yet, but if we do have a RAID controller, we might want to ask the operating system not to do its request reorder and merging because it doesn't understand much about my disks and the I.O. system underneath, and the RAID controller probably does a better system. And we don't want it to buffer the reads as well. So we can ask the operating system just to do direct I.O. as it's reading and writing files. And you typically only do this if you had a RAID controller, and the RAID controller could do its own merging, and all of them do a great job at that. And the last possible optimization that we could make here is that we can move all of the uh, log files to a separate set of spindles. So the log files is sequential I.O., we just keep appending. Um, I would typically recommend this only if you have a lot of disks. I wouldn't typically recommend it if you just have two disks for your table space and two for your log file, because the log file I.O. is so much fewer. But if you had maybe 10 disks, you could put two towards your log file and, and eight towards your data, and that would be a perfectly fine optimization. Um, the last optimization here that I, I didn't really draw in, I, I had it briefly on a slide, was actually there's a buffer that gets filled before we write to the log file, and you can tell if that buffer is too small if you ever see in uh, show global status that you've got log weights. And you'll typically only see that if you're writing lots of text and blobs. So with that, I'm going to, to close and say, I hope you enjoyed. This might be a little bit of a non-standard talk. I don't think I said PHP once. <laughs> and if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yeah. Uh, what's the most efficient way to do cloud-based All right. That's a great question. So, sure. So this design of InnoDB really supports doing hot backups, which is non-blocking backups. And um, there are two tools that do this. One is called MySQL Enterprise Backup. It was formerly called InnoDB Hot Backup. It's a commercial tool. One is called Extra Backup, which we write. They both do the same thing. The Extra Backup one is free and open source and, and, and good. So what it does to be able to back up is it backs up your table space. It does a dirty read of your table space because there are changes happening at the same time. But at the same time as doing the backup, it watch, watches the log file because it can see all the modifications that are happening. And when it's finished backing up the table space, it can, of its pending changes that it watched in the log file, reapply them. And you can do a backup of InnoDB without blocking anyone just by that nice mechanism. Extra backup is the piece of software you want to use. InnoDB is, uh, what do you mean by for file? Yeah, it's, it's a raw backup. It's not, it's not a logical backup. It's not a MySQL dump. So it's very fast to be able to restore. InnoDB is much better to backup than my eyes are. Um, you, you talked about uh, MVCC. Sure. We all know that it's awesome uh, because uh, it allows non-blocking reads. Yes. Uh, what you didn't mention is the drawbacks of uh, having MVCC name sure. uh, the need for compaction. Uh, because, of course, you end okay. up having okay, so copy and write, basically. No. Uh, well, sort of. No. Maybe not. In, uh, <laughs> this is my understanding. Sure. So, so I'll, I'll cut off and explain briefly, and then we can have yeah. a chat and keep going. So InnoDB does an update in place, and it does a relocation of the old data to undo space. So it doesn't have, for the data, a need for compaction. And 
Potentially, this update could be more expensive. Potentially. In reality, it's not too bad because it's just a, a logical operation to relocate to undo space, which results in a dirty page. And in a typical uh, transactional system where the transactions are fairly short, it's probably deleted that undo space before it wrote the dirty page out. So InnoDB's implementation is quite good for MVCC, in my opinion. Uh, there are other systems that just do append only, and they, ha they do have this compaction problem. There's only a small exception to that, which is InnoDB's indexes actually all cont contain all rows, all versions. And that can result in some fragmentation in your indexes. Well, uh, this is, a, I think, a well-known problem of uh, MySQL that it grows quite large. Uh, so you have to either dump the entire database and rebuild the database to reclaim space, or uh, you use tricks like you alter the table to force an online uh, compaction. So yeah, I, I, I'll say that a lot of people that say optimizing my eyes and uh, my SQL right. tables, a lot of the time they're wrong. Okay. Like they, my my opinion, I could ca carry this offline and say why they're they're wrong, but you know, to be deliberately inserts some gaps as well. It only fills pages 93% full so that updates can happen. It's okay to have some fragmentation. Yeah, Just sure. optimizing a table unnecessarily is a really bad thing to do. Um, we release extra backup. Extra backup has a tool to be able to do extra backup dash dash stats on an InnoDB data file and tell you the fragmentation. And I, I think most people that are probably defragmenting probably don't have fragmentation. Okay. They're just making themselves feel, feel happy. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Good talk, thank you. Um, just out of interest, what uh, what structure is the hotspot hotspots um, uh, structure? Okay. Oh, like the adaptive hash, yeah, or yeah. it's it's a hash. Okay. So it's just uh, it's a hash of InnoDB 16k pages. It's never actually written down to disk. It's only a, a memory resident uh, representation. Um, but lots of things have hotspots. Uh, Adaptive hash is an acceleration for a hotspot. Uh, B trees themselves as a structure are very good for hotspots. They're much better than, say, a hash style structure that some other newer databases use where you have to have 100% memory fit. Um, what uh, optimizations would you recommend for running all this on SSDs? Uh, for example, how do you get a decent handle on your IOs per second? What's, what's your recommended approach? Yeah. Um, Complicated answer. Some simple things I can explain. Those settings. Uh, specifying to do more background work at once. More expensive SSDs need many read and write threads uh, to be able to exploit all of the IOPS that they can offer. Uh, that's, the, that's the simple answer. Uh, I'll probably cut it at that. <laughs> Uh, is that feasible from a uh, perspective of uh, InnoDB's architecture to support for separate I.O. on data files, uh, and w especially with different char characteristics? I can Im imagine, like, uh, for example, move some files to a separate hard drive, similar then it is similar then to the main directory. Uh, w is it possible to have multiple mechanisms, like multiple, uh, multiple sets of buffers for every se separate set of I.O.? Um. Simple answer, no. More complex answer, yes, possibly. Okay. Um, <laughs> so MySQL 5.5 has multiple buffer pools. Uh, they did this to be able to reduce locking, uh, server locking, mutex contention. But uh, it's halfway the way there to be able to, to have separate uh, priorities on those buffer pools, waiting on someone to maybe write a patch or enhancement for it. I can see it coming. Um, I don't know anyone working on it yet, though. And I can't comment for Oracle's engineering. Hi. Um, how does uh, InnoDB uh, get on with things like partitioning and using uh, file per table and partitioning schemas it, and things as well? Interesting. In terms of performance? Yeah, so InnoDB actually has no understanding of partitioning. That happens at the layer above the storage engine. So it handles it by, by, as multiple different tables. Uh, one sometimes dogma, complicated discussion is some people think that having more files is, is faster than having one big file. Uh, it's not really true. It turns out to be 
true with ext3 when you're using odirect, one of my suggested optimizations, because odirect will serialize multiple writes in a file to be one write thread to the layer below. And that's a real problem that a good file system like XFS doesn't have. Um, but, you know, it works like anything else does, I guess. Uh, InnoDB has no knowledge of partitioning, but it can take advantage of it. Our strategy has been we've got enough RAM to put our whole database in RAM. So do you, if you could offer some comment about whether yeah. the SSD drives are still valuable in that case or? Yeah, so the question is, is uh, kind of paraphrasing, um, I could buy lots of memory or I could buy SSDs, what should I do? If you can fit all your data in memory, buy memory. Absolutely, without a doubt, smartest decision. If I go back, I'm going to have to go back a lot of, Slides to show the, the numbers everybody should know that I, I sourced from a Google presentation. I can point out where SSDs are. And everyone talks about how fast they are, but they're slower than memory. Plus, you know, DB has to do its page recycling thing where it has to revalidate the checksum and whatever. And that has its own set of problems. So you want more memory first. The SSDs will help you, though, with writes, which more memory will not help you with. So we got maybe memory reference is 100 nanoseconds. And probably around here, maybe 50,000 nanoseconds is something like NAND flash. A while. So we got two-ish minutes? Yeah, I think so. All right. OK. No more questions? No? So thanks. No problem.